Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Kim Horton. I'm the Chief Economist and Acting CEO at the Regional Australia Institute. Uh, and welcome to this morning's webinar on creative solutions to workforce challenges. It's one I've been looking forward to for, for quite some time. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that I'm broadcasting from, which is the Noongawal people, and pay their respect to, to respect, pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And we welcome any First Nations people who are joining us today. Uh, this session is our fifth Regions Rising webinar of our 2021-2022 series, sponsored by NBN Co and Nutrien Ag Solutions, and it's our first for 2022. Today, we're getting into jobs and skills. We're honoured to have two fantastic guest speakers, the Honourable Fiona Nash, Australia's first Regional Education Commissioner, and Rachel Whiting, Director of Regional Development Australia, Riverina. Uh, and I'll, I'll introduce both of them shortly. You may have seen their bios on our social media platforms throughout the week, the bios are also available on the Regions Rising website where you would have registered. I uh, should let you know this session is being recorded and we'll make it available on our YouTube channel along with this, any slides from our presenters. Uh, media is on the line as well today. Also, remember to get vocal on social media using the hashtag Regions Rising uh, and you can tag us on Twitter at Regional AUS. Uh, regional Before we get into it, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank our, our sponsors for the whole Regions Rising National Series, NBN Co and Nutrient Ag Solutions. Without them, we would not be able to continue delivering these free webinars as well as in-person conferences from the National Summit we had last year through to our upcoming regional conferences in each state and territory over the next two years. So thank you very much to NBN and Nutrient for their continued support and their commitment to regional communities. We have an hour today, so I want to make the most of it, and, we ha and we'll have time for Q&A after our guests speak. You can submit your questions at any time through this session using the Q&A function in Zoom. Make sure to note your organisation, where you're from, uh, and who you're directing your question to, if anyone in particular. If your question is chosen, my team here will enable your microphone so that you can ask it directly. We have received a couple of questions in advance, and hopefully you'll hear those answers to those questions woven into the discussion today. Today, we'll be diving into the issue of labour shortages in regions and the creative ways in which we can tackle regional workforce challenges. We'll cover policies, trends and regional responses. In policies, first, uh, Honourable Fiona Nash will share with us her plans for strengthening education in Australia's regions, especially post-school skill building. Regional career paths are becoming more diverse and professionalised, and the regional education system plays a critical role in connecting young people and older people too, with the opportunities that are coming. We look forward to hearing more about the Commissioner's priorities. Following the Commissioner's presentation, I'll share some information from the RAI's 2021 Labor Market Report findings. Looking across 2021, we saw that advertised vacancies across regional Australia grew by around 36% across the year, while the actual size of the regional workforce only grew by 1%. No surprise then that unemployment is very low, and that the regional labour market is extremely tight. With the big growth in demand for skilled workers now and into the future, what's needed now is investment in the availability of quality post-school training and learning across regional Australia. Our third panellist covers regional responses. Tight labour markets have been a challenge in the New South Wales Riverina region for many years, and leaders in the region have been rolling out some very creative and effective responses. RDA Riverina Director Rachel Whiting will show us what these labour shortages and skill shortages actually look like on the ground and what can be done about them. First up, I'd like to welcome the Honourable Fiona Nash. Having grown up in Sydney, Fiona has spent the last couple of decades living and working in regional Australia. For many years, she was involved in a farming enterprise in the central west of New South Wales, which her sons Will and Henry are now running. And I think we can see some of the output from that behind Fiona there in the, in the, in the, in the vase. So Fiona spent 12 years in the federal parliament as Senator for New South Wales, and also held ministerial positions, including rural health, and in cabinet, the positions of regional development, regional communications, and local government and territories. She also held the position of deputy leader of the nationals. From 2018 to 2021, Fiona was the Strategic Advisor, Regional Engagement and Government Relations for Charles Sturt University. Fiona was appointed by the Australian Government as the Regional Education Commissioner in December 2021. Fiona, over to you. Thank you, Kim. 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 Thank you,
Kim, thank you very much. And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining us here today. And I'm delighted to be here on the panel today. Um, as Kim mentioned, the federal government, government appointed me the first regional education commissioner uh, just in December last year. And the commissioner came about as a recommendation from the NAFINE review, which was a review into rural, regional and remote education in 2019. So my role is, is very much as a champion for rural, regional and remote people when it comes to education. I think we all know that there are real gaps and real discrepancies when we look from city to country uh, in education. And a lot of my role will be working with stakeholders, with the education sector, with communities, uh, people right across the regions to look at what we can do to make sure that we get better outcomes for rural, regional and remote people when it comes to education. A key part of my role will be giving advice to government uh, around those, those particular issues. So the work that I'm doing with stakeholders and out on the ground talking to people is vitally important because as I, as I very often say, the, the solutions to the challenges that we see, and in this instance in education, in rural and regional and remote areas, the solutions so often are out there on the ground in the regions themselves. So I've been uh, very busy, very early days in the job so far, but, but very busy making sure that the first thing I do is connecting with the stakeholders about those issues and potentially about the solutions. So I was delighted when uh, Kim asked me to be part of the panel today because education in the regions is going to be vital to the workforces that we create in the regions. And there's that real linkage through from regional education opportunities and, and the workforce that we need out in the regions. And I was particularly interested to note where we look at uh, uh, on the, the, the scroll before we started the, the, the webinar around how can regions attract labour. And I think there's an extra part of that as well, as well as looking at how we attract labour to the regions and how we attract workforce to the regions, how do we create better opportunities to home grow it in the regions? How do we look at our young people in the regions, our students coming through schools and the tertiary education system, and even people who might have moved a little further on in life who want to reskill or go back to what they were doing at an earlier part in life? How do we create those opportunities to enable them to do that better in the regions so we can better home grow that workforce? And those greater opportunities to study or skill up locally are going to be vital and a lot of the work that I will be doing as commissioner going forward. I think it's really important to note as well, it's not um, just higher education universities that I'm focused on, it's going to be vocational very much as well. And in terms of skilling up the regions, I've always said that the university sector and the vocational sector, one isn't better than the other, they're just different. And they are different pathways and different things for, for people to, to learn from, to go through, to get to that workforce point uh, that they need, to, they need to get to. My role actually takes in from early childhood, right through schools, through to the vocational and higher ed sector in rural and regional and remote communities. So it's a, it's a big, it's a big area to cover. Uh, as I say, only early days being in the role, but very much looking forward to exploring all of those and where we can do things better. One of the key things I think for students when it comes to education in the regions and the eventual workforce opportunities is giving them that opportunity to stay if they choose to. But quite often a lot of our young people particularly do wanna head out of town for a while or go somewhere else to, to access education. So I think it's really important that we focus on how do we create the pathways for those students who do leave regional communities to come back. And we're seeing this more and more over time that young people who have gone away for education or early work opportunities, they're becoming very, very keen to come home and settle in the region. So I think the more we can keep that, keep that connection to young people as they're leaving regional communities so it's easy for them to come back, is really important. One of the other key things I think is really important in terms of local regional workforce is, is the notion of training people in the regions so they stay in the regions. And we know from a lot of work that's been done that it works. And certainly the federal government setting up the Murray-Darling Medical Network on that basis. So to have medical schools out in the regions 
to train in the region. So we've got those graduates going out into the regions to be the doctors and, uh, that we need out in the bush is really important and a real recognition that that works. So a lot of the work that I'll be exploring is how do we broaden that out? How do we do that better? When it comes to broader education, how do we look at the opportunities and the possibilities to increase that regional training with a view to them being more likely when they graduate or go through their skills training to actually stay in the regions or even move to another region? And that's really important as well. Certainly around industry and one of the, the parts of my role and as, as I'm kicking off into the new role, it's interesting the themes that are emerging from the various people that I'm talking to. And one is the importance of industry linkage back into education pathways and which ties in, of course, with workforce need. And we need to make sure that out in the regions we're identifying the workforce that industry needs and ensuring that those people are coming through a pathway to fill those jobs. But I think we can do a lot better the industry linkages back into education pathways. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing Rachel speak uh, shortly and all the work that they've done down there in her region. Because if we've got that happening, and they're, they're, at the moment there's, there's almost a bit of a disconnect between industry and potential workforce, i.e. people who are studying. There are some really great ad hoc examples where we're seeing industry do great work with linking back into early in schools with students and then even at university or in, in TAFE vocational education. And part of, of what I'm very keen to explore is how do we do that better? How do we broaden that out? How do we scale that up and make sure that um, those opportunities are there to link that together? Because identifying that need in industry and what they need for the workforce is going to very much tie into the education that's provided to get them there to that job. Uh, removing the barriers to education will certainly be part of what I'm focused on. The issues, as many people would know, around cost, around geography, uh, are real and present. And we know that that creates such a gap between city and country when it comes to access and attainment and indeed aspiration. And I was having a discussion with, uh, with a fellow the other day around aspiration in regional students and particularly young people. And we were saying that the aspirations there, often what they don't have is the self-belief. They don't believe that they can actually go on and, and be a doctor or be a rocket scientist or be an engineer or be whatever they want. So I think it's really important in this role that I focus on working with people right across the sector is how do we give particularly young people the ability to believe that they can be whatever they want to be. And that, I think, will be a key part of feeding into to the education pathways, feeding into that, that end workforce that we're going to see. And of course, just the, the last point I'd make is around when we're attracting people to the regions, it's not just about the jobs and everybody will know this. It's about the community itself because often we're trying to attract somebody to town for a particular job and they'll have a spouse or a partner, uh, often children, and it's all of the ancillary things that are in that regional community that those people will look at before they move to a regional community, whether the health services are good enough, what the schools are like, is there any capacity for, for arts? There's a whole range of things. So it's not just about looking at the job, it's about looking at the whole community and how we sell that well. I mean, I've always said regional Australia is the best place to live, without a doubt. Obviously, now with COVID, there's a whole lot of people in the cities that are recognising that as well, that we've all known for decades. Uh, but I think capitalising on the, the, the obvious benefits and positives of the regions is really important. And that's my starting point. Regional Australia is an absolutely brilliant place to live, work, grow, do, be. And that's what we've got to sell to people and that will attract people to the region. It sounds very simple. It's not that simple, but it's a very important starting point that we don't talk about the, the deficit. We talk about the real positives in regional communities. And that's what I'll be very much focused on in this role. So thank you very much, Kim. Looking forward to hearing you and Rachel and being part of the Q&A. Thank you, Fiona. And look, we really echo those sentiments. The, positive, the positivity around, in and around regions at the moment is, is really strong. And 
that notion about livability and, and the whole package that, that, that the regions offer, and also that, that desire to really sort of make sure those pathways are available in region for people to connect those jobs. I'll, I'll, I'll touch on those a bit in my presentation. Now, I can, I can see there's a number of questions coming through for you. People are obviously very keen to find out more about your role and also very keen to connect with you, I think, in these, particularly in, in these early stages. So we'll, we'll try and pick up some of those uh, when we get to the Q&A. Uh, so I'm just going to take a few minutes now to run through the findings of our uh, last, here we go, our last um, regional quarterly jobs update. Uh, there's a couple of key stats there which I wanted to share with you as, as an audience, not just, just to give, give you a sense of how much things have changed and, and how and when we're talking about uh, the sort of the, the shortages and the, and the skills needs, just to give you a sense of, of what sort of scale we're looking at. So I'll, I'll run through this fairly quickly. Um, just to give you a sense of what we found. I'll, I'll talk first a little bit about how, how rapidly these regional skills needs have changed. Uh, regional skills demand has grown much faster than reg regional populations and in fact, regional workforce as well, which is why we're at such a tight, tight point at the moment. And I'll finish up by talking a little bit about why I think it's so critical that we grow that regional workforce. Uh, so the big numbers, now uh, in Jan the January data just came out. So we draw this data from the National Skills Commission that the uh, Department of Employment, Skills and Education releases every, every month. It's really good data. But they've been doing it for over a decade, so there's a real consistency in it. Over 72,000 job vacancies in regional Australia uh, in January this, this year, which was down slightly from the, from the real peak was in November. There's always a bit of a seasonal dip uh, in December, January. Employers don't advertise as much. I think there's a lot of word of mouth recruiting for casual work, but there's not as much uh, advertising of long-term jobs over December, January. So there's always a bit of a dip. Um, but 72,000, more than double the, uh, the, 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 the low point at the start of the COVID uh, crisis in, in April and well above the previous high in 2011, which is at the height of the mining boom, which is about 60,000. The big difference now between now and the mining boom is that in the mining boom, the jobs were mostly mining related jobs, construction trades and professions, and in mostly mining related regions. Uh, at the moment, it's just across the board. There's a whole range of occupations that are in demand, and it really is across the country too. There's very few places that haven't seen very significant job growth, uh, vacancy growth over the last year. There's been steady growth, in regional vacancies since that April 2020 low, up around 20 to 60% just through 2021 in most regions. So again, there's, there's a bit of regional variation, uh, but there's nowhere that's, that hasn't had a double digit growth uh, over 2021 in terms of job vacancies. The clear pattern is that in regional employers are needing people with skills, but while vacancies have surged, regional employment is lagging. And I just want to share this chart with you that my colleague and senior economist, Dewa Hopkins did for us. The dark blue line there is the number of people employed in regional Australia on this long running uh, ABS series. And the light blue line is the number of job vacancies that, that are advertised. You can see sort of steady growth in uh, numbers of people employed in regional Australia over the last decade, dipped through COVID continues to sort of pick up then on, on the trend pre covid but then it's really flattened out. Just in the last year or 18 months, that numbers of uh, jobs counted, the people employed that the ABS are counting in regions, looks like it's flattened out at a time when those vacancies are really starting to, to, to ratchet up even further. Uh, so, you know, we, we think this is probably partly to do with those closed international borders, that flow of migrants to regions, which we didn't really realise we were there. We thought migration was largely a city story, but that flow of migrants to regions, which I think a lot of our regional employers had, had relied on, has really slowed. And I think that's why our regional workforce is kind of almost flatlined there while, while job vacancies are, are continuing to, to, to ramp up. Of course, when you've got uh, high vacancies and low employment growth, that means low unemployment. Uh, and here we've got the, uh, the, the trend of r r regional Australia and then uh, metro Australia in terms of those unemployment rates. Uh, the, the big uh, kicker here for us was that about the same time as the, the, the Prime Minister started talking about a national target of 4% unemployment, regions were already there. Uh, in the, at the end of last year, uh, regional unemployment uh, averaged around 3.8%, which is already under that 4% target. Again, varies a bit from region to region, but it's quite interesting for us that the whole across all of regional Australia, that's all the non-metro greater capital areas, the average of all that, uh, including the highs and the lows, maybe it was was under was under four percent. Now there was a handful of places that are around four, five, six percent, um, and as Rachel knows very well, there's also a, a large handful of places that are under two percent in those official unemployment counts. Now that's extremely tight. That really means that the pool of available workers has really shrunk and is really small. This is about the skill stuff. This is about the professionalisation of jobs in regions. Re work in regional Australia no longer means rural jobs. 
Uh, and this is a, a time series for about, again, about a decade. And what's interesting for me here is it's, a, a decade is, is not long really in terms of economic structural change, but on the left-hand side, we've got the, the peak of job demand by occupation uh, in terms of these vacancies during the mining boom, totaled up, if you add, add all those up, it was about 60,000. Uh, fell away again after the mining boom and then growth across to the right-hand side uh, to, 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 to our current uh, period. But what we can see is that at the mining boom, most of the uh, jobs were, the largest numbers of jobs were for the, the dark blue line, which is professionals, the, the green line, which is trades, and then the pinky line, which is labourers. But what's happened in that, and it's only just a decade, and these, these are only jobs in regional Australia, professions have gone way ahead, Trades are coming back up, but it looks to me as though the gap between professions and trades is widening a bit. So that professionalisation of the regional workforce is getting stronger, not weaker. Uh, Labouring's dropped right off. And what's come in the middle is sort of clerical admin and also community and personal service workers. So what that means is that our three most uh, highest level occupations, which are managers, professionals uh, and uh, uh, trades uh, account for about half of all the jobs that are currently being advertised. So they're at least trade qualification and above. And if you add in a lot of those uh, clerical and community and personal service workers jobs, we're getting to around three quarters of the jobs needing a search for or above. Now this is in regional Australia, right? So we've seen a major change. We used to think about regional Australia as, as having lots of low skilled labouring jobs. They're still there, but they've been com completely dwarfed. The growth has really been completely dwarfed by these uh, skilled jobs. And this is what employers are telling us they're looking for. So this is not the OBS tracking actual jobs. This is what employers are telling us that they're actually looking for. The conundrum, as people in many parts of regional Australia know, is that population growth has traditionally been quite low in many inland places and has been concentrated along the east coast. Interestingly, when we look at our regional movers index, which we released last week, there are signs this is starting to change that some of those high cost, high amenity places on the east coast have lost a bit of their shine. I mean, we looked at the December quarter that where people were moving to from cities last year, they were actually moving inland. And a lot of our high growth places were, were inland places, which is very welcome news in this really tight uh, labour market. Vacancies are rising, so we do need better matching of newcomers to required skills. And Fiona mentioned that, that flow of people is really important. But I think the real gold for us in, in all this is getting better matching of locals to those re required skills. There's a lot of competition for people. When I describe that mix of high school, these are, are well-paying jobs pr predominantly in regional Australia. Uh, still, while house prices have gone up, they're still about half what they are in the capital. So for people with those skills, there's a lot of places they can choose to go. So that movement through is really important. Uh, attracting workers from other places. We have a, a campaign called Move to More, which is really pitching to people in outer suburban, uh, uh, residents of, of the capital city, outer suburbs, trying to pitch them the idea of considering a regional move because it's a really good time to do that. The migrant flows are really important, but the real uh, goal for us, I think, is in, is in growing that local skills base and growing that local workforce to meet that increasing sort of professionalisation of jobs in regional Australia. Local interventions, if you can get this match right, and I think Fiona's right about connecting up employers and, and young people and schools and trainers, and, and I'm sure that uh, Rachel will talk about this as well. If we can get those young people, we, people skilled up, trained up and into the, those uh, higher skilled jobs, it'll lift average incomes in regions, which has been a real challenge for a long time, but it'll, and it'll also reduce welfare dependency. And of course, if we get more local people into those well-paying jobs, they'll spend a bit more locally. That'll increase the diversity of sales, uh, uh, retail and service uh, uh, offerings in that region. So you get this sort of virtuous cycle of, uh, of growth that can happen. But the, and the bottom line of it all is, uh, is building that edu educational base. Um, we did a, a big review about, eight, uh, about, about, uh, 10, about 10 years ago, the, the European Union did a big review about what was working in terms of regional development in Europe. And the real no regrets pathway, the thing that always worked at some stage and to some, and to some effect was increasing the availability of education in a regional setting in Europe. Other things were, were hit or miss, you know, whether it was big capital investment, infrastructure, um, investments in other, uh, other sort of capital works, they, they were hit and miss, but the core thing that always worked was, was investment in, in education. And I think that's, that's sort of where we're getting to at the moment in regional Australia too. So I'll, I'll finish there. Those, those slides are available, our quarterly updates available, and we're happy to sort of share that around. But now I'd really like to uh, welcome Rachel, because Rachel has been living this kind of scenario for quite some time, not just the last year, not just the last 18 months, but I know the market has been very tight in, uh, in, in the river arena for quite some years. And uh, uh, Rachel's coined this phrase about uh, the, the living in a region where there's been more jobs than there have been people and jobs growth has been faster than people growth for, for quite some years. 
Rachel is the Director of uh, Regional Development uh, at uh, Australia in, in the Riverina. Uh, Rachel has lived in regional communities in New South Wales, Western Australia and Queensland throughout her professional career. Rachel has worked extensively with not-for-profits, both as a board member and as management. Rachel is passionate in her quest for others to understand the need for skilled workers in regional Australia and the benefits of living regionally. More jobs than people has been her mantra. In her spare time, Rachel has also been breeding horses for the Olympic disciplines for over 20 years, as is a vice president of the CWA Riverina Group, and has a background in arts education, practice and facilitation. Rachel is an adjunct professional staff member at Charles Sturt University, a fellow at Leadership WA, holds a Master of Communications from Charles Sturt University, a graduate certificate in animal studies from University of Queensland, and a Bachelor of Education majoring in visual arts and English from QUT. Rachel, over to you. Thanks, Kim. Um, great to be here and talking to you all today. And I'm just going to really briefly share um, the projects we've been working on and, and why we've um, come, come to work on these projects in the Riverina. But there's so much more detail behind it all. So I'm really happy to answer the questions in the Q&A and answer questions from people afterwards as well. So I'll just try and share my screen. Is that working, Kim? Yep, yes, great. Thank you. Okay, so um, 14 LGAs in the Riverina RDA region. Um, and today I'm speaking to you from Wagga Wagga, which is Wiradjuri country. So the first thing I'd like to point out to you all is that um, workforce development is RDA Riverina's number one strategic priority. And I think that's really important when you're talking in this space. Is this just something that you're adding on or is this really important to your community? And we've been talking now for some years that this is exceptionally important to us. And you can see it's their SP number one. Um, how did we come to this place? Okay, so in, in the Riverina, our workforce is ageing. And back in um, 2016, we, we were quite worried about this and we started to pull all our resources together and we held a workshop in Griffith and we invited Ivan Neville from um, Department of Education, Skills and Employment to come and chat to us. And he confirmed our worst fears. He said to us, you guys are going to have a lack of workers just based on um, people retiring and, um, and businesses growing, just normal expansion and growth. And so we thought, right, so we have to become a lot more organised. And, and we worked out back at that time, back in 2018, based on 2016 figures and projections, that the Riverina would need up to 10,000 um, more workers in the next five years. So that's when we really started talking publicly about this issue and um, how we were going to address it. Go back to um, May last year and um, the level of job vacancies, and Kim touched on this and even more recent statistics, um, doubled. So in, in, um, since 2016 to 2021, the, the number of jobs advertised in the Riverina had doubled. And we were surveying our um, employers and they were saying that almost 50% of employers in the Riverina at that stage could not find the staff they need. Um, we think it's probably even more now. And the, the roles were left unfilled in that case and 80% definitely had trouble recruiting. So what did we do about that? Last year, we launched a skills study. Um, we worked in partnership with Charles Sturt University to actually do some real research to prove um, what we were saying, what we, we felt we knew, but actually to prove it. Um, it took us two years to, to gather the information and get it together. Um, so we have that document and we use that. So we don't want it to be that shelf sitting um, book. We want it to actually be something that's utilized I'm using it in my business case for Adama. 
um, for the Riverina and we use it to actually say to, to those that are interested in investing and partnering with us on some of our programs, this is the proof that this is a real problem. Here's some more complications. Um, and I think this, this is, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad Kim mentioned this too. What we saw in the mining boom is happening all over regional Australia now. Other, other growth, other construction, other projects. And um, we have about 8,000 construction and project jobs in our region and neighbouring regions in the pipeline. This information all came from ICM. So that's an added complication. So we're already at 2% unemployment, maybe less. Um, we've got this coming. So what did we do about it? A number of these projects existed in some shape or form um, back before 2018. We really grabbed them, um, put more resources behind them, looked for future and extra partners and um, created more opportunity for growth in this space. And there's still more opportunity there and we're still always looking for more people to partner with. And um, Kim asked me to talk about too how we partner with um, LGAs, with councils on these programs. So I'm, I'm going to talk about that as well through this slide. So um, Country Change, um, this is a program that um, has been around for probably 15 years, definitely before my time with RDA Riverina. Um, but we, we found some funding to revamp it. And it's really about um, how Fiona mentioned we need to promote the benefit um, of living regionally. So it details information on all the LGAs on all the towns within the Riverina region. Um, Country Change is a partnership um, with 13 of our councils. Um, and we've also added to that in numerous ways. One of those ways is also to join the Regional Activators Alliance and to be members of that Move to More campaign on behalf of Country Change. So all of those councils are getting that benefit as well. Um, so it's, it's done so much more as well. We, um, we've used it for our Growing reach, Regions of Welcome partnership with um, New South Wales, Multicultural New South Wales. So that's about secondary refugee resettlement. So it's a way to really inform those people considering a move from Western Sydney who are refugees that have been in, in Australia for a number of years to inform them about what it's like living in these towns when they start to look at the job opportunities. Because yes, it's about the job, but it's also about the livability. We've got Grow Our Own. Um, this is a program that started in the Western Riverina by Deakin University and Bendigo Bank. So it's, um, it's a program RDA Riverina have been involved in since the beginning, but we've um, now been running it ourselves for a couple of years with a number of partners. Um, and there is enormous scope in this space for um, expansion, both further across our region, um, into other regions, and also um, just in, in the programs we offer. Um, the crux of it is um, what Fiona was talking about, connecting our young people um, in school and as school leavers to employers and then finding the educational pathway that best matches both the young person and the employer. But we really want that employer-young person relationship and we have multiple case studies and we're about to launch um, a heap of new videos in partnership with Murrumbidgee High um, that showcase what can be done and the and the opportunities available in our region for careers because I think um, I think sometimes our our parents in regional areas and even our teachers don't understand the career opportunities. It's not just jobs, it's real careers in our region. So that's what we want to do. I noticed the comments coming up on the screen before. Absolutely, this is all about you cannot be what you cannot see. It really is about showcasing um, those opportunities. But um, yeah, there, there's far more opportunity for growth there. Also got on the screen our skilled migration program. So we've been working in partnership 
with both Home Affairs and um, with Investment New South Wales in um, two visa pathways um, for regional Australia and particularly for our region um, for a number of years, as have most RDAs in New South Wales. So we see that as really valuable. And that program in itself gave us um, the experience of both working closely with employers and with migrants, which then helped us with the um, Growing Regions of Welcome program, the Refugee Resettlement Program. So all of these programs interrelate. Um, we have staff working on specific programs, but we all talk to each other because things pop up and we're able to help each other with solutions. Um, you go to a um, Grow Our Own Network meeting with employers and we'll start talking about skilled migration as well, because while they really want our young people in their, um, in their businesses, sometimes that's not going to give them the solution they need right at the time. So it, it's integrated. We don't believe any one um, solution is the answer for now, that we need to be working right across the spectrum. Um, Jobs Riverina is a platform that we set up that we're also hoping to expand and add um, a number of different components to in the next couple of months. So that's showcasing what jobs are available in our region and it's free for employers to list jobs. And we did that because as we know, and I think Kim mentioned too, so many jobs aren't advertised. Um, it still can be an issue because um, we know employers get fatigue from advertising positions that aren't filled. So even though they're free, sometimes those jobs don't get on there. And that's when we just need that local knowledge and those relationships and that network of talking about what's going on. But I'll just click through here and show you the partners. Um, so for the growing regions of welcome, um, pilot program with Multicultural New South Wales. We're working with four LGAs in our region and two as a priority for relocation. This pilot program is also um, uh, mirrored in the Murray region and Red Cross are leading it in that region. For country change, we're working with 13 councils um, and, and something that might come up in a question, but I'll, I'm happy to share it up front too, don't wait for everyone to come on board to collaborate. Um, those that want to work with you, just get on board and, and start doing it and others will join later. And grow our own, two councils and at the moment 11 um, business partners or industry groups and there's scope for so much more in that space. Um, Complications come when you try and solve these problems. And last year we, um, we ran a housing summit with RDA Arana just to try and talk through those issues. Um, and I know RAI have run um, sessions on housing and heaps of other regions are looking at this as well. But this is a problem. It, it's, a, it's a problem that can't be avoided. Um, we need to work on solutions, but we don't believe that means we should stop still trying to attract people to come here and stop encouraging our young people that this is where their futures are. Um, it, it's it's an issue, but it also um, we can work together to find solutions. That's it. Thanks very much, Kim. Thank you, Rachel. That was terrific. And, you know... I think you can see why we asked Rachel to share her story. There's, there's a lot going on. It's a really quite a well considered, I think, and well and, and strategic kind of approach, tackling lots of different dimensions at once. And the thing that I really love about it, it is, I don't know how to say this politely, it's it's medium term. It's like it's not 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 stuck to electoral cycles. We know that the community is going to be there well outside the next election and the one after that. So are those employers, so are those young people. So it's all about putting those building blocks in place working those local networks really hard to find those local solutions, local, local connections, and I, I really like that. Now, we've got a lot, thanks, Rachel. We've got a, a load of good questions. Uh, I think I'd like to start with uh, Diana Fear. Diana, you had a, because there was a lot of questions, Fiona, about you and, and what's up next for you, and I think, Diana, you had a question about what uh, how you might connect with Fiona and, and what her regional engagement might look like. Would you like to answer that question? Ask that question, sorry. Sure, sure. can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Okay. Hi, Fiona. Congratulations on your new position. Um, I guess we're just probably everyone's interested in what your tenure is, how long that position is, 
and also how you're going to engage with stakeholders and what your time frame is in in this engagement process whether you'll be holding meetings in the, in the regions and how it will work out Diane I will. hello how are you nice to, uh, nice to hear your voice um Diana, look, it's really it's really early days but one of the the key things is going to be the connection to people on the ground as i was saying earlier in my presentation so um i have a, a secretariat of four people in the department of education in canberra and i have an ea support um with me up here uh, in the north of the state so it's only a really small team so in terms of, of that support, um, they're absolutely fantastic, but we're only really a very, very small team. So my tenure uh, at is three years, um, three years at this stage, uh, and hopefully, I mean, we'll, we'll see, see what happens down the track. You never know there is an, an option for an extra two after those initial three years should uh, decision makers want to, want, to continue, want to continue with it. In terms of the engagement on the ground, um, and I don't want to raise expectations at the same time as saying I will be getting out there on the ground. It's a national position. It's the whole of the country. So I'm not going to be able to get into every single town. But what I will be doing is, in a, in a targeted way, getting out on the ground in the regions as much as I possibly can because, again, that local connection to people and talking to people when they're on the ground, in their place, and the challenges are going to be different and it's not going to be a one-size-fits-all response, which is why it's really important that I get across a spread of the whole nation and not just initially, that's going to happen continually. So insofar as I can get to as many places, I will do. I will, of course, be doing a lot of individual meetings with, with all sorts of different stakeholders from the sector, from the community, um, out on the ground with, with students. And I think one of the great things that's come from COVID is the ability to actually be able to do things virtually, like today. So there'll be a lot of virtual connection as well as the, the on the ground connection as well, Diana. Thanks, Fiona. That's very, it's very exciting to have, you know, education a focus out here because it's yeah, certainly thanks. what we need. Um, uh, thanks, Diana. And what I will do is I'll pop the email um, for the Secretariat uh, up on the, uh, when I get a chance to, to pop, it in the, pop it in the chat box. And I did see a question there for, from someone before about a contact to get through the gatekeepers. I don't have very many gatekeepers, there's pretty <laughs> much just me. So, um, so don't worry that there's going to be a tribe of people keeping people away from me. It's not going to work like that at all. Thank you, Fiona. We, we love your accessibility and your pragmatism. That's a very good, good appointment, I think, to this, 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 this position. Um, now, we've got a, a lot of questions about uh, uh, workforce attraction, engagement in workforce and engagement in learning. Um, I wonder, Rachel Soden, you had an interesting point about reaching out of the labour force, uh, out of those sort of really tight pools, into, and I think your point was about engaging people with disabilities. And I might get you to ask that question. And, and Fiona and Rachel, think about it in terms of not just engaging people with disabilities, but how do we like to reach out of this sort of existing pool and draw other people back into learning or other people back into the labor force. Um, Rachel, would you like to ask your question? Um, thank you. Thank you, Kim. Um, um, and thank you for the opportunity to ask a question. Um, Fiona, I actually um, have come through uh, state PNC and then into the Disability Carers Council and the New South Wales Care. Uh, um, uh, yeah, the Disability Council and the New South Wales Carers Council. So this is, um, uh, you've sort of hit on um, my extreme, um, where I really, really love um, looking at. And um, I've spent the last 28 years in regional New South Wales from way down south in Balranald all the way to Wilcannia, Colorinabri and Moray and now in Urala. So I've kind of really done the whole the whole gamut of rural New South Wales. Um, and I'm I'm sort of looking at um, when you when you're looking at engaging people in employment, um, I, I'm looking at how how do you particularly tap into people with disabilities and then their unpaid carers who may have been in, out of the workforce for a long time because they've been unpaid carers. And so how do we like tap, how, how, how is your, um, how are you going to look at supporting those people back into employment? Because they're already in the, they're already in the regions and they may need that extra support to get into employment. And there are, they're people with with great skills 
but often they haven't had the access and often they are people who may be on um, long term on um, government support. Um, so it, it, I just wonder, you know, can you see a role for your for you um, supporting those people? Rachel, it is a really, really good question. And I sort of touched on earlier, it's not just about young people and students coming through school and university. It's exactly what you're talking. How do we get the greatest opportunity for people who need to reskill or upskill who've been out of the workforce for some time? And it can be for various reasons, you know, some, some of which you've mentioned. And I think the barriers are for those people getting back into the workforce. If it's difficult to navigate how to get the skill that they need to re-enter the workforce, if it's cost prohibitive, if they if it's too much of a financial impost for them to do it in whatever way, shape, or form, uh, if it's a, if it's a tyranny of distance issue, if they have to travel to actually upskill to get the skills they need to get back into the workforce, I mean they're just a couple of the things that are those barriers that sit there for most for most people. So I see part of my role is looking at exactly what you're talking about. So for those people, what are the things that would give them greater opportunity to be able to take up that opportunity to go back into the workforce? I haven't got all the answers eight weeks in, but when we look at, at Rachel's presentation and, and Kim's comments from what he said about the, 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 lack, of, um, the lack of work and the lack of workforce, we need to be really clever and smart about thinking, well, how do we maximise every opportunity to increase the workforce? And that includes people who've been out for, who've been out for some time and want to re-enter. Thanks, Fiona. Rachel Whiting, do you have a, a response to that? Because I know you've put feelers out in many different parts of your community, haven't you, to try to find and, and, and support people back into the workforce? Sure. Um, thanks, Kim. I'm definitely not an expert in this space, um, but through our um, refugee resettlement meetings for New South Wales Bro yesterday, one of the things we were talking about is what um, education, what support do we need to um, provide for employers? Um, and, and that's perhaps an issue as well. So how do we need to educate our employers um, not to be worried or concerned about um, trying different groups that they may, to what they may have, tried before um, as part of their workforce. So um, that might be part of the answer, um, but, I, I'm, but I definitely agree we should be looking at everyone and anyone um, interested in employment. Thank you. Um, I just want to, uh, there's a number of questions about, about this sort of engagement partnerships process. And then Ben Archer, you had a, a, a question about uh, engaging with with business and industry, would you like to put that put that question? Because I think that seems to be coming through as quite an important part of building not only build, building the aspirations, but building those pathways, and making them clear to, to both sides. Would you like, like to ask your question, Ben? Yeah, certainly. Um, <clears throat> ben Archer, I'm with Tarry University's campus on the Mid North Coast, and also doing my PhD with James Cook University, looking at regional economics. Um, one of the things that's coming through in a lot of research is the role that in-school careers advisors have in not just helping improve aspirations and outcomes for students, but also helping them um, navigate the barriers to staying local and staying in the area in which they live. However, there seems to be a bit of a disconnect with what's actually happening on the ground in schools, where many of my colleagues, particularly within um, professional associations are uh, highlighting the fact that they've gone from being a pure careers advisor position down to, in some cases, teaching 80% um, of their time and only 20% actually doing careers. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if there is any movement or any um, additional um, support that can be given for schools in regional areas to help um, ensure that they've got appropriately qualified careers advice is providing appropriate advice for students and helping them um, provide um, boosts to the regions, particularly when, you know, in some areas you're losing 1,200 people, young people a year to cities for further education. Um, ben, that is one of probably the top five issues on my very early list. Um, if we haven't got the right structure in place for careers advisors to be able to do the best job they can, 
it's going to be the students who are going to who are going to to miss out on opportunities. What I see in so many of our terrific careers advisors, and they're just great, if they're, if they're building aspiration for students that they can go on and be whatever they want to be, that's absolutely terrific. But I think you use the words navigating. It's also navigating the system for, for things that they want to go on and do. So I'm having a very close look at this, this issue of, of careers. Um, I take the points, absolutely take the points that you've raised because they've got to be able to do the best job they can and not a not, a, not what I call a half job because of other distractions or other things that are, that are happening that take them away from the focus on careers. The other thing that interests me as well, which I will have a look at is, and it's terrific for the students in that school to have careers advice, but going back to, to Rachel's point before about people re-entering the workforce, where do they get careers advice? They're not, they're not at the school, they're not, um, you know, they're not a student. So how do we make things easier in terms of careers advice for people who want to re-enter the workforce as well. So if you're on something that's uh, very much a priority for me, Ben. Thanks, Fiona. And Rachel, what are your thoughts about Because you've, you've been trying to build those connections with schools, haven't you? Yes. Um, look, we part of our work with Grow Our Own is to support careers advisors in, in schools with um, resources because as, as you highlighted, they don't always have the time to do that outreach um, that perhaps they need to be doing. And I think one of the challenges also is that if we have shortages of teachers in schools, mm -hmm. then are those careers advisors when they should be having their lessons off to work in that space, are they teaching instead, picking up extras from other, other staff? So um, I, I think that's probably what you were alluding to. Um, it, it's absolutely an issue. Um, so whatever we can do to assist in that space, I think should be done. I wonder if I might ask both of you to comment on the, the, the other part of that, which is obviously your, your connection with business, small business, local business. Have you, is it on your agenda, Fiona and, and Rachel, what sort of things have you done that have worked well to connect, you know, your um, potential labour force with business and, and, and vice versa? Fiona first, perhaps? Yeah, sure, thank you. Um, well, eight weeks in, so not a lot of actual on the ground as yet. What I am planning to do, though, because I think there's two sort of different levels in terms of that industry connectivity. Um, one, I'm wanting to host a roundtable uh, with business, so BCA, Aki, Cosboa, a bunch of high-end, and, and around some out people out of the key industries out in the regions as well. So from a high-level business perspective, what do they see as the important things in improving that connectivity back into education pathways? But then at a local level, and I think what we need to keep in mind with this is, is there's going to be different opportunities and different ways of connecting in different regions. It's not going to be a one size fits all. So what I'm keen to do, I was talking to a, a local man the other day and they had all this enthusiasm for pulling industry together, exactly what we're talking about with the students, but not necessarily a mechanism to enable it, to pull it together and enable it to be successful. And I think we all know that if you, if you want to achieve something in a regional community, it takes leadership and drivers and people who are keen to drive it. So I'm very keen to look at what, what is a, a model that could work in regional communities to link the two things together and then be able to replicate it, not, not as an exact science, but looking at how do we actually put something in place as, as a go-to model to, to do the linkage. Um, we work constantly with business in our region and also network with other organisations doing the same. So we're always hearing um, about what their concerns are, especially in the workforce space and especially since that's our, um, one of our strategic priorities. Um, I would think most RDAs would be in the same space across the country. Thank you. Um, we had another question, uh, which is to me, it was about, really about the growth in job vacancies and, and is it because of uh, lots of retirements, this sort of great resignation that we're hearing about in the States. Um, I just reading what other labour economists in Australia are writing, I, I don't think there's much sign of that. Our, our sort of rate of separations from work hasn't really increased very much after that sort of hiccup with the, with the pandemic. Um, I think what we see, though, it is, it is you know, it's, it's very strange to see these very large percentage increases in vacancies and this relatively quite slow growth in the labour force. There's something, something amiss there. 
And I think just touching on particularly something Rachel said earlier, um, our interpretation, and we, we actually got a, a, we just finished a large scale survey in uh, regional New South Wales, which gives us some insight, but our, our interpretation is that you know, employers have had to go to the internet, to, 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 they've had to cast the net wider because those local labour pools really have dried up. We, we haven't had as much, as much flow through of, um, uh, well, we, early in, in 2020, there was sort of border restrictions and, and people weren't moving domestically. And we certainly haven't had much international flow. So we, we think that the, the, the advertising is, as, as Rachel has said, said kind, of, kind of the second best solution for a lot of employers. They much prefer to use, use word of mouth and those local networks, they're really critical. Um, but they're turning to the internet and having to advertise because those 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 local networks and those local labour forces just, just aren't delivering. So I think it, it, otherwise, you know, we're not seeing you know 30, 40, 50 percent uh, levels of economic growth. Um, so when we're seeing 30, 40, 50 percent levels of, of, of reaching out for staff, I think it's got to be some other factor there which is pushing that advertising. And, and I think it's that uh, that need for you know, employers to have fall, fall back on, on advertising. I think as, as Rachel said, it's, it's it's often a second best solution for regional employers. Um, but again, this, I think this just emphasises the importance of building those networks because the more that you're, I mean, a lot of our regional manufacturing, a lot of our regional manufacturers are, uh, they've invested quite heavily in their business. They're still competitive uh, at a national and, and generally an international scale. They're looking to build that confidence that they'll have a long-term skilled a pipeline of skilled workers well into the future. Uh, so for them, you know, working back with year tens, year eights, year sixes in, in some parts of the country, I know, to sort of, you know, ensure that them and their parents know that there are good, well-paying jobs in this business, in this region, is, is a really important part of widening that labour pool. So they're not, you know, in a sense, if they can sort of cultivate that pathway and be confident in that pathway, that takes the pressure off them having to recruit randomly over the internet, because I think those of us who've had to do it all say, you know, it really is a, a double-edged thing. Um, did you want to make a comment on that, Rachel? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Kim. Um, yes, we speak to businesses all the time that um, what is stopping their expansion and their R&D is lack of workforce. It's not government grants. It's um, not investment. It's lack of workforce. And it's um, a major issue in our region. And it's, it's, the, it's the last thing we want at the moment, isn't it? We've got all these other economic fundamentals in place. There's, there's investment opportunity. We want business investment to grow. And that's, that's a real a real handicap. Um, look, I just we've got a couple of minutes left. There's been a number of questions, and I don't think we can really leave without touching on housing. Um, Fiona, there's been questions about, you know, if we're successful in all this and we, st and we do start to build demand for regional learning, that's good, but that may mean, you know, people staying longer in regions so that there's less uh, housing availability. And Rachel, I know this is an issue for you. Um, do either of you have any, have, you, have any sort of quick kind of closing comments on, on housing and its relationship with uh, skills development and workforce issues? Uh, look, I think that's something that's been across the regions recently on everybody's top of mind. And it's not just housing, it's all the other services that need to be provided by local government for when we've got to look um, deal with a population increase for, for whatever reason. So I don't, I don't have a specific answer to the current housing problem. What I have got in my role is the capacity to work right across governments. So I'm not constrained just to the education portfolio. I can work right across government, and which is going to be the benefit on the, uh, having a commission and now uh, in place, because it almost is a, a broker role in a lot of ways and bringing all these things together and big cross portfolios. So it will all tie into the bigger picture and the answers we need to find to some of these challenges. Rachel? Um, I know that um, the New South Wales government put out um, 21 LGAs of, that they saw as important to um, enable more housing development um, just last week or the week before and, and that's great news um, we're looking forward to seeing um, what the New South Wales um, Housing Task Force yeah. um, comes up with um, with solutions um, but I think what we need to remember is there's an, a number of other LGAs there's a number of other towns that are in desperate need of more housing that weren't on that list and um, we'll continue to um, raise those um, situations and and support them where we can i think the conversations that are having that are being had in in the regions and across the country are fabulous it, it's great that people are talking about things and sharing ideas and um yeah let's see what can happen yeah thank you i think it's a bit like the learning option isn't it i mean it's it's uh these aren't there there's, there's a handful of sort of quick fixes partial sort of fixes but a lot of it is sort of medium and longer term 
um, we'll be releasing our uh, uh, regional housing discussion paper in, 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 a, in about a month's time. It, it, it identifies a couple of different types of regional housing market failures, which, which need different kinds of responses. And again, they're sort of short as medium term. In, in the short term, you know, we, we had a, a housing webinar uh, last year, and one of the councils tomorrow was talking about, they actually did a, did a bed order trying to find if there were people who are willing to rent out rooms to people who were, in, in, in a sense, their frustration was there was no accommodation for the construction workers that, that they wanted to have to come and build the houses that they, they needed. So they thought they'd, they'd start there. So it's hard to find a short term solution in housing. It really is repurposing is, is another tactic. One of the things the Institute has been working on is really just trying to demonstrate the scale of demand and need for housing in regions and pitch that back to a different class of investor who perhaps might not, look, not, might not have been looking at a regional market for, for commercial mm -hmm. reasons. So there are, there's lots of different aspects. Um, look, I think time's against us. Uh, folks, it's one o'clock. Thank you again to our, uh, everyone for joining us online. We had some really good questions. Thank you especially to the Honourable Fiona Nash. Thank you, Fiona. Uh, and Rachel for your time today. Really in insightful and, and valuable uh, feedback from, from both of you. And I think that this discussion is gonna continue for, for a long time yet. Um, as I said at the beginning, we'll make this recording available on the Regions Rising website, which is regionsrising.regionalaustralia.org.au. And Emily may put a link into the chat. She's very quick with that sort of thing. You can always keep the conversation going on social media, hashtag Regions Rising. If you haven't already, sign up to our newsletter to get more information on our Regions Rising webinars and our in-person events that we'll be rolling out through the rest of this year. Thank you very much for participating, everybody, and have a good day.